We're now going to look at some conditions involving the gastrointestinal system. And the first of these I want us to look at is cleft lip. In cleft lip, the lip uh, did not fuse appropriately. Uh, sometimes this is also called a hair lip. One of the big problems for children with a cleft lip is feeding because they get so much air in as they're sucking. So we need to make sure these children sit upright and we burp them rather frequently because of the feeding issues with cleft lip. Another big concern is that the children with cleft lip are not so attractive. I mean, when you bond with a child, you bond with a child's face. So sometimes nurses, uh, it's necessary for us to model loving and accepting of the child. Uh, they might ask you about the treatment for cleft lip, and that is surgery, usually done about eight weeks or so of age, somewhere between six and 12 weeks. The key things I think they would ask you about on that are the fact that after surgery, you want to use elbow restraints on that child so they cannot get their hands up and pull out the sutures. And you probably will clean the suture line with some normal saline. This shows you what a child with cleft lip could look like, a single or a double uh, cleft uh, with that. After surgery, these children are just beautiful. Uh, the plastic surgery is so wonderful. They really look very nice. The mother of a newborn who has a cleft palate says to the nurse, I plan to breastfeed. This won't cause any problem, will it? How should the nurse reply? You will need to pump your breast until after surgery. You can pump your breasts and give your baby milk in a special feeder. Your baby will feed slowly but should be able to breastfeed. It will be impossible to breastfeed. Now note that this child has a cleft palate, which means that there is no suction created at all. So the correct answer is going to be number two, because this baby will not be able to feed normally. Uh, with a cleft palate, uh, they will have to use a special type of feeder, either a feeder that uh, has a special elongated nipple type of thing, or perhaps we put tubing on the end of a syringe and put it in the side of the mouth uh, and put it back uh, into the mouth on, on one side. But children with cleft palate cannot suck. They therefore get a lot of air in and they swallow a lot of air. And oftentimes as they uh, try to feed, the food, the milk will actually come out their nose. So it's, it's a major issue feeding. Surgery is usually done somewhere around 18 months in that one to two year time range. And afterwards, they might ask you questions about the care of the child. Elbow restraints, again, so they can't reach the suture line. And they need to be able to drink from a cup and not a little sippy cup either, a real cup. We don't want any spoons, straws, sippy cups, anything of that nature going into the child's mouth after surgery. Um, now, another defect we don't want to talk about is esophageal atresia. And this one, the esophagus ends in a blind pouch, which means there is no connection with the stomach. Sometimes it even connects with the trachea, and we have a tracheoesophageal fistula. Children uh, who have an esophageal atresia will probably pick it up with their first feeding when they choke. They will be kept NPO. They will need a gastrostomy tube because uh, you can't do an NG tube, a gastrostomy tube, a tube directly into their stomach. And remember, these children need to suck, so they're probably going to need a pacifier. If you take a look at this picture, this picture shows us some of the types of uh, esophageal atresia that you can see. And what happens is we do have this uh, esophagus here ending in a blind pouch. Uh, if you look at the other pictures with that, we notice that over here we see one that actually connects here to the trachea. You can see up here it connects to the trachea. Um, with this one, the child will choke immediately. This shows another var va variation of that where it connects right to the trachea. 
Uh, surgery will need to be done at some point, but the most urgent need is the G-tube so that the child can feed, can receive nourishment. Another uh, GI type problem is pyloric stenosis, where the pyloric sphincter hypertrophies. The characteristic assessment finding of this is projectile vomiting when the child is about three weeks old or so it starts. They will then develop failure to thrive. They look like that child with cystic fibrosis. And obviously, if they're vomiting a lot of acid, they end up in metabolic alkalosis. The treatment and management of pyloric stenosis is surgery. And usually following surgery, these children do quite well. If you take a look at this picture of pyloric stenosis, you can actually see up here this very hypertrophied pyloric muscle at this point. And if you look down here at this picture down here, you can see this poor child looks like failure to thrive. You can almost see those reverse peristaltic waves. Surgery will correct this problem. Another uh, defect is intussusception. And this is a really difficult one uh, to look at. In this one, you see the bowel telescopes in upon itself. If you could imagine a long, skinny balloon, and you push one end up into the other, this is essentially what's going on with intussusception. So it's pushing back in upon itself. The blood supply comes in from the side. So as it pushes back like that, it's going to cut off the blood supply to the intestines and can cause gangrene very quickly. Now with intussusception, we said we have that telescoping of the bowel. It occurs usually around the ages of three to 12 months. The child pulls up their knees. They've got this terribly sharp abdominal pain. The vomitus is usually bile stain because nothing is going through. And we describe the stool as being current jelly. So currants are a red berry. So it's a bloody mucousy stool. Frequently, uh, they will do a barium enema to help diagnose the problem of intussusception. Sometimes that will, the weight of the barium might straighten it out, but not usually. So frequently they end up with surgery uh, to solve this problem of intussusception. The next condition we want to look at is megacolon or Hirschsprung's disease. In this condition, there is a lack of parasympathetic nervous system supply to the distal colon. So there's no peristalsis there, and it just fills up and fills up with fecal material. Uh, and then eventually, sometimes they get a little ribbon-like stool from that. But they get these huge, big, over-distended colons, megacolon. A two-year-old who has megacolon has normal saline enemas ordered QD. The nurse understands the rationale for using saline to be, one, it is the most effective solution for clearing the bowel. Two, it is used to treat the underlying hyponatremia. Three, it protects against fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Or four, it is less irritating to the skin than other solutions. And the reason for using normal saline is number three. It protects against fluid and electrolyte imbalances. It's isotonic solution. The usual treatment for megacolon is going to be either daily enemas, as we just saw in the previous question, or sometimes they do a colostomy, which may end up being temporary because as the child matures, they may be able to pull some ganglia down and actually help to create a nerve supply uh, to the colon. So it's either colostomy or daily normal saline enemas. Another problem for us to look at is celiac disease. This is another malabsorption syndrome. The symptoms are actually kind of similar to cystic fibrosis. They get steatorrhea, those bulky, frothy, fatty, foul-smelling stools, diarrhea, failure to thrive. So they look much like that cystic fibrosis child. Only the cause is different. Children with celiac disease cannot digest gluten. And gluten is found in a number of grains. It is found in barley, rye, oats, and wheat. 
So when children have celiac disease, we tell them, we put them on the brow diet. Avoid brow, avoid barley, rye, oats, and wheat, which means that as far as flowers are concerned, they can only have rice and corn. Let's look at a question. All of the following foods are on the tray of a child who has celiac disease. Which should the nurse remove? Toast, juice, butter, or egg? And the answer, of course, is number one, toast. Now, diet for a child with celiac disease is difficult because so many things contain wheat flour. That means not only can they not have toast, they cannot have gravy because that's usually thickened with flour. They can have cookies and crackers and cakes. Uh, all of those things can have wheat flour. Pies have wheat flour. Um, so you, you have to teach the parents really to be very careful label readers. Now we want to talk about parasites. Uh, in America, we have a number of parasites. Probably the most common among childhood parasites is pinworms. And the life cycle of a pinworm is this. The mama pinworm lays the eggs on the anus. The child scratches, and after touching their toys so that they spread the disease to their siblings and friends, they put their hands in their mouth, swallow the eggs, and then the cycle starts over again. The egg grows up to be a mama pinworm. Mama pinworm lays the eggs on the anus. The child scratches, and the cycle repeats itself. We diagnose pinworms with the scotch tape test. This is one of the few uh, intestinal parasites that we don't use a stool specimen for. But we put scotch tape over the anus first thing in the morning. That picks up the eggs. We put it on a microscope slide, and then the physician can see the eggs uh, on the microscope. We really recommend that they treat the whole family. Uh, it's very contagious. So we give them some type of uh, anti-helminthic drug or uh, anti-parasite drug. We also would highly recommend that they disinfect the toys and clothing. So underwear, pajamas, sheets, all of those things need to be washed in in very strong detergent and to wipe down all the toys the child may have touched with antiseptic solution. There's just one other type of parasite I might mention, and I think there's been a question that asked about hookworms. And so the nurse is trying to teach uh, parents how to prevent hookworms in their children. What would you recommend that they do? And the answer would be wear shoes when you're outside playing because it's thought that hookworm enters the system through the feet, any breaks in the skin by, by going barefoot because uh, it lives in the soil.